Hi, everybody. So this is uh, chapter one, a brief audio review as promised. So to start off, we have to define what sociology is. So sociology is one of the social sciences, and the social sciences are just disciplines that examine the human or social world. So sociologists are interested in all aspects of society. Societies are just groups of people who shape their lives in patterned ways that distinguish their group from other social groups. The social sciences are really interested in understanding the social world the same way that the natural sciences are interested in understanding the natural or physical world. Social scientists and natural scientists even use many of the same research methods, including the scientific method, which we'll talk about much more in chapter two. So sociology looks at a broad range of institutions. This is something we'll be talking about a lot throughout the semester. Institutions are just structures in society, such as uh, education, economics, politics, um, institutions that give us a better understanding of social relationships. As we'll discuss later, each one of these social institutions have certain rules that they teach us to live by, right? They socialize us in different ways to have different values. So sociology can help you develop a sociological perspective, which is a way of looking at the world through a sociological lens. So, you know, sociologists have developed several approaches for developing a sociological perspective. The first being beginner's mind. So this is an approach to the world where you look at it without your preconceived ideology or biases, um, which is very difficult to do. A lot of people think that they can be objective, um, but it's very, very difficult to not judge, not stigmatize, not fall trap into the stereotypes and biases that you've been taught right throughout your life. So beginner's mind is important because if we are going to be able to look at our own society critically, we need to be able to look at it as an outsider would look at our society, right? Not being so steeped within the culture that we cannot see the inequalities within it, the social divisions within it, the realities and social roles that go on within it, right? So beginner's mind is a very important concept. Um, it's really being able to look at the world um, but hold back your bias, um, culture shock is another way that um, sociologists often, um, you know, help people understand how to develop a sociological perspective. Um, part of this has to do with just being confronted with something that's different from what you're used to. Oftentimes when we're confronted with something different, we try to fit it into the understandings of the reality that we have. So normally when we would talk about this in class, um, I would ask you for examples <laughs> of culture shock, right? And people always give some really interesting examples. Um, but for myself, um, the example I like to give, because it really illuminates the idea of how culture shock um, is really our brain trying to understand it based on our limited understandings, right? So when I was young and um, just basically the worst age to travel cross country with your family is when I did that at about 12, which is when you're like, you know, like the sassy preteen that hates life. But anyway, so we're on this like incredibly long road trip and um, <laughs> we're in one of the square states in the middle I don't really know which and um, we're stopped at some sort of truck stop you know going through um, like a small store there and I see these two dudes that are like dressed in a full suit tailored suits like matching tailored suits um, but not like fancy suits like you could tell they were handmade um, and they they had like long beards, right? So me being 12 I'm from Southern California, I look at these dudes and I just immediately assume that they're in some sort of band, right? What else would make sense? Why else would they be wearing the same suit? Why else would they be wearing something that looks a little handmade? Because, you know, before all your millennial um, clothing options, the well, clothing options back in the day were slightly more limited, right? If you wanted to... Um, have something customizable you customized it yourself and then so I turn the corner in this in this little store and I see their female counterparts which are like women in these like bonnets right and I just kind of stop there mouth agape confused and my dad walks up and is like they're Amish and I was like oh because I'd heard about the Amish as a kid you know something you kind of learn about a little bit but living in a culture where you don't come in contact with the Amish people right I got to see them get back in their horse and buggy and ride back to you know their um, lifestyle without any sort of semblance of electricity 
it was really interesting for me as a kid to realize I had just, a, I had just tried to fit them into the reality I already understood, right? By assuming they were a band because I didn't understand the cultural reality that they really existed in, which was the Amish. That's really how culture shock works. Oftentimes when you go to another culture, you see things that are different. It really can make you aware of the differences within our own culture that we often don't see, right? Because we're in our own culture. It can make it very difficult to critically view it when you're on the inside. And of course, last but not least, actually probably the most important, something we'll be talking about throughout the entire course, is the sociological imagination, right? This is the intersection of biography and society. So meaning looking at the social structure and the historical context of someone's personal experiences, right? So let's say, um, you know, for my own personal experience, let's just look at how life would have been different for you or I in 1817, 1917 or 2017, right? Well, I mean, first off, <laughs> in uh, the first and definitely probably most likely the second as well, unless I was like from uh, Europe and very wealthy, which I'm neither, um, in those two contexts of realities, I wouldn't be a professor, right? Because uh, the kind of social and political limitations that said that women weren't um, it wasn't necessary for a woman to get a higher education, right? If she was only going to be tending to children or taking care of the home, there was no reason to... Actually, what's interesting, around the 1817 time period, there were some um, more bizarre biological ideas. Like if you let a woman read, it would somehow upset her uterus. Like she wouldn't be able to have children. Like I'm not joking. Like that's literally what people thought, right? So obviously that sets up the context of the individual's experience, whether or not I could have been a professor as a female. In 1817, 1917, not so much, right? So obviously that's going to set up our experiences, but you can think about it in many other different ways, right? Not just my own example. Um, you can think about just even how much some of these changes that have happened in even the last hundred years um, definitely have affected our understandings of the world. Right. So the fact that only a couple generations ago, right, like 100 years ago, if you wanted to converse with someone on a different continent, you had to put a letter on a boat and wait several months to correspond back and forth. Right. They, you'd write a letter to them. They'd eventually get it. They'd write you a letter back. And uh, what's interesting is oftentimes if wealthy, um, privileged people were traveling, they would often get home before their letters did. Right, because the the system of of um, ex that exchange was so limited. Right, think about nowadays. Nowadays, you don't even have to uh, just talk to someone uh, through a phone. You can actually look at their face. Right, like we have Skype or these kind of other tools that make it so we can video conference people in real time across the world. Right, that has dramatically changed the kind of opportunities, the economy, all sorts of other stuff that we'll be talking about throughout the class. So really the sociological imagination is saying you can't just look at an individual's experience, you can't just look at the social context, you have to look at the two of them to truly understand what you're seeing, right? Because otherwise you're only getting half of the picture. So, you know, if you're, let's say, um, you know, for me what I like to, my example I like to give is that um, <clears throat> if I were given the opportunity to um, go in a time machine, right? The, I would, I'd pick the future, right? <laughs> More so than the past. I mean, it's one of those things um, where if we're talking about the social, political, cultural history, when was it ever a better time to be a person of color in this country? When was it ever a better time to be a woman, right? When has it ever been a better time to be LGBTQ? Um, if you're any marginality, <clears throat> that doesn't have as much power represent representation in society, then like me, you would probably choose to go to the future and take a gamble that we figured that stuff out then <laughs> than you would to go to the past, right? Because the last thing you want is to get stuck in the past in a time machine. So yeah, I think it's an interesting um, concept that is very fundamental to understanding sociology. It's being able to understand that, yes, a person's individual choices are important, but what choices or opportunities they have is often constrained by their culture, the history, right? The specific 
political economy of the time. And we'll get into some more specific examples of these things, right? Like what life would have been like before the civil rights movement, right? Has affected a lot of people's opportunities. What life was like before cell phones, right? Having this kind of instant connection to people has changed life in a lot of ways. So we'll talk about a lot of this as we go on through the course. So in sociology, um, sociologists are going to use different levels of analysis to explore social relationships. So um, there's micro-sociology and macro-sociology. This is something, again, we'll get in more depth into in Chapter 2. The micro is typically uh, studying face-to-face -face and small group interactions in order to understand how they affect larger patterns and institutions of society. So typically, micro-sociological approaches are going to use qualitative methods that are looking at questions of why instead of what. And like I said, we'll go over that in Chapter 2. And of course, macro-sociology, which is the level of analysis that studies large-scale social structures in order to determine how they affect the lives of groups and individuals. So typically, a macro-sociological approach is going to use quantitative methods that are going to look at questions of what and how instead of why, like larger-scale things. So for example, micro-sociological analysis might look at the relationship between a couple or interactions of a sports team or even interaction between a cashier and a shopper. Um, and like I said, in chapter two, I'm going to give you an example of micro from um, a preeminent uh, criminologist um, named Randall Collins to give you an example uh, from his book, Violence. And then, of course, macro sociological analysis might look at something like the economy and how it impacts consumer behavior or maybe how a presidential election influences American morale. So examples of micro, I mean macro, um, would be looking at things like, let's say, if you wanted to understand what the concepts glass ceiling and glass escalator are, um, then you would typically look at large scale labor statistics for something like that. So we'll talk about this more in chapter two. So theories in sociology are propositions that seek to explain the social world and help to make predictions about future events. So theories are also sometimes referred to as approaches, schools of thought, paradigms or perspectives. Typically I say paradigms, but <laughs> they're all the same. So there are different ways of approaching or looking at specific topics. And so, you know, sociologists tend to disagree about which are the best or which things are more valid. And there's times when considering many different perspectives or theories actually can lead to better understandings of the topic, like layering them together. Um, so there is no right or wrong. They're just different perspectives that try and understand what is going on within the social world. And we're going to go over a few of them in depth throughout the course, um, but you should know it's, it's an intro class. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more paradigms out there within sociology. So when it comes to the sociology's roots, um, Comte stated that sociology needed to be treated like any other scientific discipline. So he laid the groundwork for future sociologists and helped establish the discipline itself because he was the first person that said that there should be a scientific study of society, right? He called it social physics, which I think is cooler than sociology, but whatever. Um, but basically he was a French scientist and he studied things um, using the scientific method. So he developed a theory of the progress of human thinking from its early theological and metaphysical stages towards what he calls positivistic, positive or scientific stages. So we'll talk about him a little bit more as we go through. But basically um, what you just need to know is he's kind of like the first guy to study it um, from a scientific perspective. Um, Harriet Martineau was also very important to the foundation of sociology as a paradigm. Um, well, as a, as, a, as a discipline as well. So she was a social activist who traveled to the U.S. and wrote about social changes. And, I mean, to say that she was radical for the time period is understating it times a million. Um, she wasn't quite popular because of some of the stuff that she said. So basically, the big footnote that they give here is that we wouldn't know who Comte was in the English-speaking world without Martineau because she is the one who translated all of his work and made it accessible to America and England. But basically, she's a journalist, political economist, and she came to the U.S. and she basically came here and, and said, if you believe in freedom, if you believe in liberty and democracy, why are you such hypocrites? Right? She pointed out that people were in chains right? that under the, the institution of slavery, that women didn't have the same rights as men, right? that poor people suffered in economic conditions you know, that were terrible. And so she basically said, if you believe in equality and democracy and freedom, 
why aren't you giving that kind of opportunity to all of your citizens? So probably not the most popular, right? Because of her radical views at the time. So, you know, she supported labor unions, abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, all that kind of stuff. Um, Herbert Spencer is um, really the first, like, English-speaking sociologist, um, which I don't feel like is uh, valid enough on its own <laughs> to be this. Well, he was basically the person that was trying to understand the evolution of societies in a similar way that that Darwin was trying to understand the evolution of, you know, the actual, what he called the theory of evolution. So, you know, Spencer... Um, his philosophy is often referred to as social Darwinism, but I feel so bad for Herbert Spencer because basically no one that's heard the term social Darwinism has the correct definition, right? They have this understanding of, of social Darwinism that the strongest survive, right? But that's really much more of like a, a masculinist thing that we put on based on our gender understandings after the fact. What Darwin and ultimately Spencer were actually talking about is it's not about... It's not about strong as much as it's, uh, you know how he's, he called it survival the fittest, right, is how Darwin termed it. Um, it just means the most adaptable. So species, plants, animals, whatever they are, that are the most able to adapt to changes are the ones who survive, right? So he was looking at that through a social context, through social Darwinism, but people tend to think of it in this weird, like, the strong survive thing. Which again, we'll talk about this a lot through the class. There's like a lot of weird pseudoscience ideas about what sociology is out there. So I'll just be shutting that stuff down as we go. So Spencer was interesting because he didn't have an academic training, right? He just grew up in a family that encouraged him to think and learn independently. So, um, you know, he wasn't like super privileged like a lot of the other thinkers. So instead of going to college, um, even though he was interested in physical science, he became a railway engineer and um, he eventually became a journalist once uh, the railroad road work kind of dried up a bit. Um, so he's an interesting contributor to this because he's different than a lot of the other thinkers. Um, and then, of course, Durkheim. We'll be talking about him a lot, right? Durkheim worked to establish sociology as an academic discipline so that now I have a job. So thanks, Durkheim. But anyway, he studied the social factors that bond and hold people together. So what's interesting is he thought that, like, even the most individual thing could be studied sociologically. So he was looking at um, something he considered so, so individual that it would be difficult to study sociologically. So he studied suicide, right? And he was interested in the relationship between social isolation and suicide at a macro level. So it's really interesting, like through his work, you could understand that there's basically... Um, there's certain times a year people are more likely to commit suicide. There's certain social factors that lead people more likelihood. Um, and this is important because basically it shows that even though it's something that is considered very individual, if you back up and look at it systematically with large-scale statistics, you can start to see patterns that emerge that aren't there to the naked eye, right? So um, he basically he looked at uh, types of societies, right? We'll talk about him later, about his idea of um, organic or mechanical solidarity, right? Meaning just that the kind of bonds that people develop within a society depending on the organization of that society. <clears throat> and really, he believed that even the most individualistic of actions had sociological explanations. So he wanted to establish a scientific methodology to study those actions. So, you know, he, again, studied suicide. He looked at factors such as religious affiliation, marital status, employment, um, you know, it's really interesting, and we'll get into um, a lot of the stuff that he talked about later on. All right, so some more thinkers, early thinkers. Marx, right? He's a German philosopher and political activist who contributed significantly to sociology's conflict theory. So he theorized that capitalism creates social inequality between two groups, what he called the bourgeoisie, the people who own the means of production, meaning money, factories, natural resources, land, and the proletariat, who are the workers, who basically the only thing that they own is their own physical labor, right? So Marx predicted that inequality leads to class conflict. And sociologists have really found that Marx's theories continue to provide powerful tools for understanding social phenomena. And his ideas of this conflict between social groups is central to the working of society. 
serves as the engine of social change and is one of the most vital perspectives in sociology today, right? Conflict theory is still a major sociological paradigm and he's the dude that kicked it off, though we'll talk about how people have built onto it a lot. So Marx noted that a small percentage of the population owned the means of production, like I said, the bourgeoisie, and because they owned things, they were able to exploit the masses and ensure greater gains for themselves. So that's the basic tenet of capitalism today. And many modern sociologists use Marx's theories to evaluate contemporary workplace. So we'll talk about him a lot more as we go. Weber, Max Weber, this uh, real happy looking dude right there. Um, he also studied how society was becoming industrialized. Um, he was also looking at kind of a conflict theory perspective. But he was concerned with the process of rationalization, meaning when you apply economic logic to all of human activity, kind of like reducing everything to a computerized output. So he believed that contemporary life was filled with disenchantment, which came from the dehumanizing features of our modern societies. So yeah, his work had some pessimistic views of social forces, and we'll talk about him later, how he had some like psychological breakdowns of his own. And actually how we don't even talk about his wife, Marianne Weber, who's the one who wrote the majority of his work up to 25 years after he died. So there's that. Um, <laughs> but why mention her? She's only the one who wrote it, right? But anyway, um, so really this idea, the, the work ethic that shapes modern life, um, you know, really he, like other theorists of his time, he was looking at the shift from a more traditional society to an, a modern industrial society. And he proposed that modern industrial societies are characterized by efficient, goal-oriented, rule-governed bureaucracies. We'll talk about bureaucracies more in depth later. But basically that individual behavior was increasingly driven by bureaucratic goals, right? Becomes more important than those motivational factors of tradition, emotion, values, right? It becomes more important to like just go to work, put on a happy face even though you hate it, and make that money, right? So Weber believed that this lifestyle left people trapped in this industrious way of life in what he called the iron cage of bureaucratic roles, which leads to disen disenchantment. So, you know, real positive, upbeat dude. We'll be talking about him a lot more as we go as well. Um, so George Herbert Mead studied the connection between thought and action or between individuals and society. So this is where we take the switch from the conflict people above to more of a symbolic interactionist viewpoint, which again, we'll get into what that means in a minute. So Mead suggested that social processes give meaning to objects and in society, meaning that we interact and meaning comes from our interactions. So for example, a chair isn't inherently a chair. Its meaning is related to its uh, relationship to us, right? So if I want to sit down, then that chair is a place to sit, right? But if I have to reach something from a uh, a tall shelf and I don't have a step ladder, that chair has now become a step stool, right? That the chair doesn't necessarily have any intrinsic meaning. It's the meaning that you develop through your interactions with it, right? I know it's a trivial example, but again, um, this, there's a lot of objects in our society like flags or religious icons that have meanings that have been shaped by social interactions. So he's a social interactionist. So we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. Um, also, Goffman, a dude we'll be talking about quite a bit, um, he studied how the self is developed through interactions with others in society, and he used this term dramaturgy, which we'll talk about a lot in Chapter 4, to describe the way that people strategically present themselves to others. So meaning that, you know, he found it interesting that a person could act, like quote-unquote act, like literally act, um, one way in front of their parents and act completely different in front of their friends. Right? Meaning that he sees the social world as kind of a performance, like a stage, like a play. Right, So when you think about it, people are usually very adept at recognizing the social situation they're in and acting accordingly. Meaning you don't talk to your friends like you talk to your boss. Right, It's very different. So this does suggest that we're always acting. So you know, we'll talk about this idea, like if you feel like you're being your true self, is that really what you're being? right? If you're just acting through this role of dramaturgy, like we'll talk about that in chapter four. So paradigms are just ways of thinking or theoretical umbrellas meant to provide a broad explanation for the way things work. So the first one we'll be talking about is structural functionalism. So they view society as an ordered system of interrelated parts or structures, which are the social institutions that make up the society themselves. So 
such as uh, family, education, politics, economy. We'll talk about a lot of these things later. But um, basically, there's a system of interrelated parts. It's like thinking about each part of society as a puzzle piece that comes together to fit as a whole, right? So each of these different structures meets the need of society by performing specific functions that benefit the whole system. So again, the key word here is function. According to this theory, everything in society has a function. So the main principles of function, fun, functionalist paradigm is that society is a stable, ordered system of interrelated parts, and that each structure has a function that contributes to that continued stability, or what they call equilibrium. Um, another school of thought we'll be talking about quite a bit is conflict theory. Right? They seek social conflict as the basis of society and social change. So conflict theory proposes that conflict and tension are the basic facts of social life. And they suggest that people have disagreements over the goals and values um, that are involved in struggles over both resources and power. Right, So there's limited resources, um, so people struggle for them. The theory focuses on the processes of dominance, competition, upheaval, and social change. So really they're emphasizing this materialistic view of society. So they're focusing on the labor practices and the economic realities for people in the society. They take a very critical stance towards the existing social relationships or something we would call the status quo, right? And it's really a dynamic model of historical change. We'll talk about this more in depth later, but that's really what Marx was setting up was um, a very historical model of looking at this throughout time. And of course, symbolic interactionism. Right? They see interaction and meaning as central to society and assume that meanings are not inherent but are rather created through inter interactions. So symbolic interactionism is, is America's unique contribution to sociology and is proved to be the most influential perspective of the 20th century. So again, society is produced and reproduced through our interactions with each other by means of our language, our interpretations of that language, um, they see face-to-face -face interaction as a building block of everything else in society because through interaction, we create meaningful social realities. So the three basic tenets, basically, are that we act towards thing on, things on the basis of their meaning, right? That idea of the chair from previously or the idea of a tree, right? Uh, what is the meaning of a tree? Well, if you are really hot and you need some shade, it's a place to get some shade. If you need to build something and you don't have materials, it's building materials, right? The tree itself, the meaning of it has everything to do with your relationship towards it in their view. Um, they also, again, argue that meanings are not inherent. They're negotiated when you interact with others. So let's say that tree means something different to you than it does to someone else. Um, you can convince that person through interactions to, to understand or see your meaning. And then the last one is that meanings can change or be modified through interaction. So, um, you know, it's something agentic. It can change. It doesn't uh, necessarily stay the same. Um, it's really, again, focused on how self and society develop when we interact with each other. So it's useful in explaining and analyzing a wide variety of social issues, um, such as inequality um, and a lot of other like family stuff we'll talk about. So some newer theoretical approaches, um, one is feminist theory, which is looking at both gender inequalities in society and the way that gender structures the social world and considers remedies to these inequalities, right? So there's a link between feminist theory and conflict theory in that they both deal with stratification and inequality in society, but both seek not only to understand inequality, but to provide remedies for inequality, right? To get rid of those inequalities, as does queer theory, right? Queer theory is similar to both conflict and feminist in that same way. They propose that categories of sexual identity are social constructs, and that no sexual category is fundamentally either deviant or normal. And of course, this is inspired by the gay and lesbian rights movements of the 70s and 80s. So queer theory came about pretty much in the late 80s and early 90s, and proposed that categories of sexuality, such as homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, trans, they're all social constructs, and we'll get into what that means in more depth later, just meaning that no sexual category is fundamentally deviant or normal. We create those meanings socially, which means that we can change those meanings as well, which makes these things so complicated. And another new theoretical approach is postmodern theory, which suggests that social reality is diverse, pluralistic, and constantly changing, 
And postmodernism was a reaction to modernism, a paradigm that trusts in the power of science and technology to create progress. So we'll get into this much more later. The whole idea of modernism is both a historical period and an ideological stance that began with the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason and basically said that, you know, people are rational, they value scientific knowledge, there's a linear view of history, right? Things went from worse to better. And that there's a belief in this universality of human nature, right? People have always been to the way that they are, right? Postmodernism argues there's no absolutes. There's no, like, your, there's no truth necessarily, right? That can be very subjective. They argue that, you know, um, order and stability are, are manufactured, that everything is relative and fragmented, temporary and contingent. So um, we'll get into that. Like, so one example of that that I hear a lot um, from the modernist perspective is when people say, oh, um, technology will solve global warming, right? Um, which I always respond to that, you know, technology already has come up with the solutions to these issues. It's the fact that the political economy doesn't allow it to take place, right? So that's what postmodernists would say. It's basically like, for example, a company like GE will go to a place like MIT where a young engineer has developed a, a type of machine that has like zero waste offput. Like the, the only byproduct of the chemical reaction is drinkable water, right? And that could replace like combustion engines on every car, bus, train, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, but instead of GE buying that and then developing it and making sure that they're like providing a sustainable future for the rest of us, they buy it and then they put it on a shelf to make sure that it can't be developed so that it won't compete with their money. So really postmodernists would say, no, science and technology won't save us. The technology is already there. But the difference is if there's no political will, if there's uh, society is controlled by a small group of people that it don't see it in that, that their interest to do anything about it, then nothing will be done, right? So we'll get into what postmodernist theory is, to what modernist theory is, all that kind of stuff later on in the class.